One Day by David Nichols Retold by F. H. Cornish Published by Macmillan Education A division of Macmillan Publishers Limited 2012 Part 1. Their Early Twenties Chapter 1. The Future Friday, the 15th of July, 1988, Rancala Street, Edinburgh, Scotland The important thing in life is to make a difference, to make a change to something, the girl said. Ah, you mean we have to change the world, the boy replied. No, not all of the world. We just have to change the bit of it around us, the girl said. She was silent for a moment, then she laughed at herself. I can't believe I said that. It's such a predictable thing to say, isn't it? But what are you going to do with your life? What's your plan? Well, my parents are coming to collect me later today, he told her. Then I'll go to France for a few weeks, and after that, maybe I'll go to China. Oh, you're going travelling, she said wearily. You're predictable, too. You've got too much money. That's your problem, Dexter. What you really mean is that you're running away from real life. Travelling broadens the mind, Emma, he said slowly. He was trying to copy the girl's accent. Suddenly, he leaned over her and kissed her. I think you're too broad-minded now, the girl said, quickly turning her face away from him. The girl was from Yorkshire, in the north of England. She was used to posh boys from the south making fun of her soft northern accent. Sometimes she didn't care, but now she suddenly felt annoyed with the boy. Everything was going wrong tonight. Anyway, I'm not talking about the immediate future, she told him. I'm not asking about tomorrow. I'm asking what you want to be in 20 years from now. At first, the best answer he could think of was, I want to be rich and famous. But then he thought a bit more and spoke seriously. I don't ever want to be different from this, he said. I'd like to stay exactly as I am now. Every 15th of July, I want to be just like this. The girl was called Emma Morley. The boy's name was Dexter Mayhew. They were lying on the narrow bed in Emma's room in a shared flat. It was four o'clock in the morning. The two young people didn't know each other very well, but certainly this was a night for thinking about the future. It was the last night of their university life in Edinburgh. Earlier in the day, after four years, they had finally graduated. Soon they would go in separate directions. Emma looked up at the boy as he leaned over her. She was a little annoyed with him, but she still thought that he was handsome. Hmm, handsome. Perhaps beautiful is a better word, she thought. And she knew that lots of the other girl students agreed with her especially the posh ones from the south. They all knew that he would get their clothes off and get them into his bed. His body was muscular and the skin of his face was tight. His eyebrows were slim and his lips were full. Yes, he's beautiful, but he looks a little like a cat, Emma told herself. I think I can imagine you when you're forty, she said unkindly. You'll have an expensive red sports car and live in the most expensive part of London. You'll be married to your third wife. No, I'm wrong. Your fourth wife. There won't be any children. You're too selfish for children. No children, just three expensive divorces. Well, Em, Dexter began crossly. Who's Em? Emma quickly asked. Your friends call you M. I've heard them call you that, he said. Ah, yes, my friends call me that, 
Emma replied. Can't I call you that? he asked. He sounded worried. Oh, all right then, Dex, she said. Go on. Well, if you think I'm so terrible, why are you sleeping with me? he asked. Well, I don't think I really have slept with you, have I? she replied. You can choose either meaning of sleep. I mean, we haven't been to sleep, and we haven't done anything else, have we? No, the boy said. No, we haven't quite done that. Tonight, Emma had wanted something different. She wasn't sure what it was, but their names sounded good together. Emma and Dexter, she thought. M and Dex. Wait there, Emma said. I'm just going to the bathroom. Don't go away. She put on her thick glasses and walked towards the door. In the bathroom, Emma asked herself why she was being difficult with the boy. He's certainly very bourgeois, and he isn't very clever, but I really like him, she told herself. Emma had liked Dexter since she'd first met him at a party two years before, but she'd never got to know him, and in just a few hours he would be gone, and he certainly wasn't going to ask her to go to China with him. It was a bit sad. For the first time in four years, she was with a boy she really liked, but she couldn't relax with him. They had been kissing and talking for eight hours now, and she still didn't know what she wanted. Dexter, waiting in the bedroom, looked around him. He had been in so many rooms like this one, rooms where girls like Emma lived. These girls always wore T-shirts with political slogans on the fronts. There were always political posters on their walls. There were always CDs of political songs. They were all the same, these girls with socialist ideas. They always thought that he was horribly bourgeois, and they always thought that being bourgeois was bad. Well, he had news for them. He thought that being bourgeois was just fine. Dexter hadn't really decided yet on a map for his future life, but he was 23 years old, and he had some ambitions. He wanted to be successful at something. He just didn't know at what. He wanted to make his parents proud of him. He wanted to meet lots of women. He wanted to have lots of fun in his life, and he wanted never to be sad. Thinking about fun and sadness, Dexter was now feeling that this night had been a mistake. There were going to be tears. There were going to be angry phone calls. Emma returned and lay down beside him again. She had put on a T-shirt with a political slogan on the front. Do you mind if we just cuddle, Dex? Emma said. Dexter didn't think this was a good idea at all, but he didn't say so. Okay, if that's what you want, he said without interest. I can't believe I just said cuddle, Emma said after a minute of silence. What a terrible bourgeois word for me to use. I'm sorry. We must get some sleep, said Dexter. He was thinking, this must never happen again. There was daylight outside the window. Dexter was still awake, and he was looking at Emma, who was sleeping next to him. I could leave quietly now before she wakes up, he told himself. Then I don't need to see her again. Will she mind? Probably. Girls usually do mind. But will I mind? It was strange, but the answer to this was not clear to Dexter. There was something about Emma. She was pretty, but she seemed to hate herself for that. The red colour of her hair was out of a bottle, and her hairstyle was awful. Dexter guessed that Emma's hair had been cut by Tilly Killick, a large, noisy girl who lived in the other room in this flat. But never mind the hair, Dexter thought. Her face is really pretty, and her body's amazing. Soon he decided that he would leave quietly, 
never mind what Emma's face and body were like. I'll probably never see her again, he told himself. Dexter was about to get quietly out of bed when Emma woke up. What are you doing later today? she asked sleepily. Tell her you're busy, said a voice in Dexter's head. I don't have any plans, he said aloud. Shall we do something together, then? she asked. Yes, all right, Dexter said. A moment later, Emma was asleep again. Chapter 2. Real Life Saturday, the 15th of July, 1989 Wolverhampton, England, and Rome, Italy Emma Morley was writing a letter. Stoke Park School, Wolverhampton Hello, Dexter. How are you? How is Rome? How is La Dolce Vita? Try a dictionary. I know that some people call Rome the Eternal City, but I've been here in Wolverhampton for two days now, and they have felt eternal to me. So perhaps Wolverhampton should be called by that name. Ha <laughs> ha! Well, I decided to take the job I told you about, so I'm working with Sledgehammer Theatre. It's a theatre in education group. For the past month, we've been touring schools with a play about slavery. Today we're performing it at this fine school. Anyway, we tried to show 11 to 13 year olds that slavery was a bad thing. Aren't we brave and original? Really, I don't know why I'm being nasty about my job. A lot of the kids have never thought about social problems of the past until now. And now some of them, the ones that don't throw things at us, are becoming really interested so I still think that we can make a difference for people. Emma was trying to be positive. She had to try hard. The last year had been full of mistakes. After her graduation, she had stayed on in Edinburgh, but she had made a series of bad career choices. There was the terrible all-girl band she had played in. There was her first novel, which she had stopped writing. There was her second novel, which she had also stopped writing. She had worked in shops, trying to sell things to tourists, but the tourists never really wanted the things she tried to sell them. So finally she had moved back to Yorkshire to live with her parents. That wasn't good either. But you've got a really good degree, Emma's mother said almost daily. Why on earth don't you use it to get yourself a good job? From time to time, Dexter Mayhew became part of her life for a few days. At the end of the summer, she had gone to stay at his rich parents' huge house in the countryside. But that had gone terribly wrong. Emma had had too much to drink one evening and had argued with Dexter's father about politics. She had shouted at him and told him he was a bourgeois fascist. Then, more recently, they had met up in London for the birthday party of one of their friends, a man called Callum O'Neill. Callum had shared a flat with Dexter in Edinburgh. He now had a successful business selling computers. Dexter and Emma had spent the day after the party together. Most of the day they lay on the grass in Kensington Gardens. They drank wine from a bottle and they talked. They never quite touched each other and Dexter told her all about a wonderful Spanish girl called Lola. Emma decided that this was all their friendship was ever going to be. Clearly Dexter didn't want to sleep with her. He wanted to tell her about the other girls he slept with. But strangely, Dexter also told her that his mother had liked her very much. She says she has a good feeling about you and me, he'd said. At the time, Emma hadn't understood the importance of Dexter's words. 
Emma didn't know that Dexter loved his mother more than anyone in the world, and she didn't know that Dexter's mother felt the same about him. Then Dexter had gone travelling again. When he was away, Emma wrote him long letters. He usually replied on postcards. They're just pen pals now, Emma told herself. We'll never be anything more to each other. Emma got a job in a pub for a while, but living with her parents was killing her mind. When an old friend phoned and offered her a job in his theatre group, she'd accepted it immediately. But now, after three months, Emma hated the theatre group. I don't want to be here making a difference, she thought. I want to be in Rome. I want to be with Dexter Mayhew. Emma made herself continue with her letter. Anyway, I've got a new plan. I've written a two-woman play about Virginia Woolf and Emily Dickinson. One of my friends from the theatre group and I want to find somewhere in London where we can stage it. Do you remember my friend Tilly Killick? We shared a flat in Edinburgh. She lives in London now and she has a spare room in her flat. So I'll probably live there for a few months. Are you coming back to London soon? Maybe we could be flatmates. Emma stopped writing. Suddenly she felt nervous. Then she wrote, It's all right, I'm just joking. But I really miss you, Dex. And she signed her name. In Rome, Dexter was out with a Danish girl. He was working as an English teacher, and the girl was one of his students. She was nineteen. I have an exam on Monday, the girl said. Test me on verbs, please, Dexter. All right. The present continuous, Dexter replied. I am kissing. You are kissing. He is kissing, said the girl. She showed him how to kiss, too. But what would Emma Morley think about this? Dexter suddenly thought. Chapter 3 The Taj Mahal Sunday the 15th of July 1990 Camden Town, London and Bombay, India Listen to me, please, everybody, Scott Mackenzie shouted. The restaurant opens in ten minutes, and I have a few things to tell you. Scott was the manager of Loco Caliente, a Tex-Mex restaurant in Camden Town, North London. The restaurant was one of a chain. First, these are the special dishes for this lunchtime, Scott went on when his staff had stopped talking. Today's special soup is corn chowder. Several of the waiters pretended to be sick, and he stopped talking again for a few seconds. And today's other special dish is an amazing fish burrito, which contains delicious pieces of cod and prawns. That's how the document from headquarters describes it anyway, and those are the words you must use too. It sounds really horrible, said one of the waiters, laughing. Look at it this way. We're bringing a taste of the North Atlantic to the beaches of Mexico, said Emma Morley. She sounded very tired as she made the joke. As she tied her waitress's apron round her waist, she noticed someone she hadn't seen before. A large man with curly, blonde hair. He was wearing a waiter's uniform, and he was quite nice-looking. "'And now here's some good news at last,' said Scott. He pointed at the stranger. "'This is Ian Whitehead, who is joining our happy team. "'Ian, this is Emma. She'll look after you today. "'She's been here longer than all the others.' Emma did not think that this was anything to be proud of. She gave Ian a little smile as one of the waiters turned on the lunchtime music. The first song was, of course, La Cucaracha. She asked herself once more what she was doing here. 
she asked herself once more what she was going to do with her life. Later, when Emma was showing Ian what he should do, she asked him about himself. I need to be in London, he said. I took this job because I need to earn some money on the side. Why? What do you really do? Emma asked. Well, he said in a funny accent, really, I'm a comedian. A comedian? What kind of comedian? asked Emma. I do stand-up comedy in the evenings. I do gigs at small comedy clubs, but they don't pay me very much. Then he surprised her. He asked her to go on a date with him that evening, to one of the clubs. She was touched, but she refused. In Bombay, Dexter Mayhew was writing a letter. Emma, 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 how are you? What are you doing? I'm in Bombay and it's raining. It rains here even harder than it rains in Edinburgh. It's too wet to go out, so I'm staying in my hotel room. I'm a bit drunk. Are you surprised? I've seen some amazing things here in India, and I've taken thousands of photos. I'll show all of them to you very very slowly when I get back. I showed some of them to a TV producer I met a few days ago. She's from London, but she's making a film here. I think she liked me. She wants me to call her when I get back to England. Maybe she'll have a job for me in TV. I'll need to work soon, and I'm banned from teaching English to foreigners. I'm not sorry about that. I hated it. But I was treated very badly. That Danish girl was twenty-one. What are you doing now? Are you still sharing a flat with Tilly? Are you still working at that horrible restaurant? You need to leave that job, Emma. Listen to me, Emma. We need to do something about your life. I'm drunk at the moment, so I'm just going to tell you what I think. You are clever. And you are beautiful, and you are lovable, and you are sexy. You should be confident. I want to take you away from boring people like Tilly Killick and Callum O'Neill, the Computer King. Would you like to live with me when I get back to England? We would just be flatmates, of course. Now, here's my plan to change your life. Are you sitting down? The shock might knock you over. You should be here with me in India. I'm going to wire you some money. I've always wanted to wire someone some money. It will make me feel important. Use the money to buy a plane ticket to Delhi. Then take a train to Agra and go to the Taj Mahal. Have you heard of it? It's a big white building, and it's named after that Indian restaurant on the Lothian Road in Edinburgh. Be there exactly at noon on the first of August. Stand under the dome with a red rose in your hand. I'll find you. I'll be carrying a white rose. Isn't that the greatest plan you've ever heard in your life? Well, Emma. I'm still drunk, but it stopped raining. I'm going out now to meet some Dutch people in a bar. I met them earlier today. They're all girls. They're nice. Don't forget the Taj Mahal at noon on the first of August. I'll find you. After he had finished the letter, Dexter took a cold shower, and soon he was feeling better. He was almost sober now. As he was dressing, he saw the letter lying on his bed. Should he send it? Suddenly, he felt nervous. He'd called Emma clever and beautiful. He'd called her lovable. He'd called her sexy. He'd asked her to live with him. Would she be angry with him? Would she come to India? Did he really want to see her that much? He decided that he did. He decided that he would post the letter that evening. He put it in his pocket and he went out.
Then he walked happily to the bar where his new friends were waiting. At about nine o'clock that evening, Dexter left the bar with one of his Dutch friends. Her name was Rene. As they left, they bumped into a large German girl with a huge backpack. She was a student from Cologne, and she was called Heidi. She was tired and cross, and she swore quietly at Dexter. It had been a long day. She crossed the room and sat down heavily on the sofa where Dexter had been sitting. A few minutes later, she moved sideways across the sofa and felt something hard pressing into her leg. She swore again. There was an envelope between the cushions of the sofa. She pulled it out and looked at it. Heidi opened the envelope and took out the letter. She read it to the end. Her English wasn't very good, but she understood most of the letter. She realised that it was important. It was the kind of letter she wanted someone to write to her. It was a beautiful letter. She wanted this person called Emma to receive it. But there was no name written on the envelope, and there was no address written on the letter. What could she do? Sadly, she realised there was nothing she could do. Chapter 4. A Career Opportunity Monday the 15th of July 1991 Camden Town and Primrose Hill, London. Listen to me, please, everyone, Scott Mackenzie shouted. The restaurant opens in ten minutes and I have some things to tell you. First, these are the special dishes for this lunchtime. Scott stopped, looked around him and then went on when his staff had stopped talking. Today's special soup is corn chowder. And the special burrito is turkey. Turkey's not a good idea in July, said Ian Whitehead wearily. Turkey's really for Christmas. He shook his head in despair. This made Emma Morley laugh. Ian was now Emma's best friend, but she rarely laughed at what he said. Scott looked at the two of them. Ian, you can clean the toilets today. Scott said. Emma, I need to talk to you in my office. Emma followed the manager into his office and sat down. I'll come straight to the point, Scott said. I'm leaving Loco Caliente soon. I'm going to be the manager of a big new restaurant in West London. Do you want to be the manager here when I go? It's a good career opportunity. Head office wants someone who isn't going anywhere. Someone who won't go away travelling or leave suddenly to start a more exciting job. And suddenly Emma was crying. What's wrong, Emma? Scott asked. Has somebody upset you? No, it's all right, Scott. It's really nothing, Emma told him. Don't worry, I'll be fine in a minute. Go and rest in the staff room, said Scott kindly. Give me your answer about the job tomorrow. A few minutes later, Emma was alone in the staff room. She looked around her in despair. She knew that she couldn't leave her job. She had to spend all her money on rent, so she needed to take the manager's job. But she didn't want to be a restaurant manager all her life. She still wanted to be a writer. Or perhaps a filmmaker, or a painter. She wanted to be something in the arts. She spent lots of time writing. She mostly wrote poems these days. But nothing was working well for her. Nobody wanted to publish her poems. Emma knew that her mother was still trying to find jobs for her in Yorkshire. Some days she thought she would go back there. I've had a battle with London, and London has won, she told herself. 
but she wasn't ready to stop fighting yet. She needed to be in London. Emma opened her handbag and took out her special notebook. The book had a beautiful cover and lovely thick white paper. It was where Emma wrote her poems. Now she took out her best pen. She thought for a minute, then she started to write a new poem about how she felt. The poem she wrote was quite short, and she knew it was really bad. She turned back through the pages of the book and found an earlier poem called Daybreak in Edinburgh. She read it. We lie here in the narrow bed and talk about the future. I look at him and think, handsome, stupid word, and I ask myself the hardest question. Might it be the real thing this time? Outside the birds begin to sing and sunlight warms the curtain. Emma looked carefully at what she had written. Can I really make the bad things in my life seem better by writing about them? She wondered. She had just decided that she could not do that because that poem was rubbish too, when Ian came into the staff room. Ian looked angry and unhappy. Emma, he said, your friend is in the restaurant again, the handsome one. He wants to see you. He's with a girl. A different one this time. Ian had seen several of Dexter's girlfriends. Dexter obviously liked to show them to Emma, and this clearly upset her. It upset Ian, too. He's a monster, Emma, Ian said. No, he's not a monster. He's just an idiot, Emma sighed, and went out into the restaurant. Dexter was with a tall, thin girl with black hair and expensive black clothes. They were reading the menu aloud to each other and laughing about it. Hello, Emma, Dexter said when he saw her. This is Naomi. Will you have a drink with us? His voice told Emma that he was drunk. I can't do that, Dex. I'm working, Emma replied. Goodbye. She turned away and walked back to the staff room. Later, before leaving the restaurant, Dexter left a handwritten note on his table. Later in the day, after Emma had finished work, she found Dexter lying on the grass on Primrose Hill a mile away. The evening sun was warm, and he was almost asleep. A half-empty wine bottle told her the reason. Emma kicked his leg. Don't do that to me, Dexter, she said angrily. Don't bring people into the restaurant to laugh at me. If you ever do that again, it's the end of our friendship. I'm sorry, Em, Dexter said. I'm really sorry. I apologise. Emma looked at him and decided that he meant what he said, for now. She sat down beside him. Won't your girlfriend be angry if she finds out that you left a note asking me to meet you? She asked. Oh, Naomi isn't really my girlfriend, Dexter replied happily. She's just someone I go out with sometimes. I'm sorry then, said Emma. Clearly I don't mean girlfriend, I mean victim. She spoke sadly, and she thought, Em and Dexter. Dex and M. No, it's never going to happen now. She picked up the bottle of wine and drank from it. Dexter looked at her and he felt warm inside. He often thought that Emma Morley was the best person he'd ever known. But he'd never really told her that. And he didn't tell her that now. For some reason... He couldn't make himself tell her that. Chapter 5 The Rules Wednesday, 15th of July, 1992 The Greek Islands 
Dexter and Emma were lying sleepily on the deck of a small ferry. The two friends were travelling from the Greek island of Rhodes to a smaller island. They were going to stay there for a week, and they were both feeling happy. Life was changing for them. After a year as manager at Loco Caliente, Emma had left her job. In September, she was going to start a college course. She was going to train to be a schoolteacher. And Dexter had a job now. He was working for a television company. He'd started with small responsibilities, making the tea, doing research for producers. But now he was working as an interviewer. He interviewed pop stars and actors on a program called The Bigger Picture. He had a posh flat in Belsize Park, an expensive part of North London. He wore expensive designer clothes. And he had a new girlfriend, his fourth one after Naomi. She was a beautiful and successful model. Emma didn't really enjoy Dexter's television appearances, but she always watched them. For the bigger picture, Dexter had invented a new character for himself. He was a man of the people. When he interviewed pop stars and actors, he spoke with a Cockney accent. Emma had never enjoyed Dexter's version of a Yorkshire accent, and she thought that his Cockney voice was even worse. Emma liked Dexter to know that she wasn't impressed by his television career. She told him this often. But all that was back in London. Today they were happy. Today they were on a ferry among the beautiful Greek islands. They were on holiday together. It had been surprisingly easy to arrange this trip. Dexter's girlfriend was very self-confident, so she had no problems about his holiday with another woman. And Emma occasionally slept with people, but still didn't have a regular boyfriend. So they had made their plans together, and they had decided on some rules of behaviour for the holiday. The rules. 1. Separate bedrooms. 2. No flirting. 3. No sleeping together. 4. No nudity. 5. No board games. Emma had decided on the first four rules. Dexter had fought back with rule 5. Emma enjoyed playing board games, but Dexter hated them. The rules had to be obeyed, Emma told herself now, lying sleepily on the deck of the ferry. The rules make this holiday possible. But Emma wondered if Dexter was going to be able to obey them. And she wondered if she was going to be able to obey them. They were half asleep when they heard an English voice. It's him, said a man. He's on TV on Fridays. Oh, yes, said a girl. He's called Dexter something. You are that man who's on TV, aren't you? She was speaking to Dexter now, and he was wide awake. Yep, on holiday, are ya? said Dexter in his pretend Cockney accent. Yeah, said the girl. Dexter continued talking to her and didn't take any notice of the man. The girl was clearly impressed. Dexter, why do you speak like that? Emma asked when the couple had gone. You aren't a Londoner and you went to Winchester College. The TV viewers won't connect with me if I don't seem like them, Dexter explained. Not many of our viewers went to Winchester. That's a very bad reason, said Emma. And you've broken rule too already. You were flirting with that girl. Emma was sitting at a table outside a small cafe on the island and drinking coffee. Dexter had gone to find them somewhere to stay. Don't forget, we need two rooms. Emma had shouted after him as he set off. 
and he'd look back at her and shouted, Of course we do! She looks so lovely these days, he told himself. It's the contact lenses. I hated those thick glasses she used to wear, but now she looks great. These rules aren't going to make life easy. But an hour later, when he returned to the cafe, Dexter seemed very pleased. There's some bad news, Emma, he said. I could only find one room on the island. It's a wonderful room, but it only has one bed. But it's a very large bed. Emma believed that Dexter hadn't tried to find two rooms. She believed that Dexter had never meant to find two rooms. And of course, she was correct. All right, let's go and see the room, Emma said wearily. But when they got there, Emma loved the room. The bed was a large one, and there was a balcony. They could stand on it and look out over the sea. The room is fine, Dexter, Emma said. We'll stay here, and you'll stay on your own side of the bed, won't you? Late that evening, Dexter and Emma walked down to the beach. The sun had disappeared, and no one else was there. Shall we swim, Emma? Dexter said. By now, Emma could read Dexter's mind. She could almost hear it working. This wasn't difficult, because Dexter only thought about a small number of things. We don't have swimsuits with us, Emma replied very slowly, speaking in the way people speak to young children. We don't need swimsuits. There's no one here, Dexter said. I understand you too well, Dex, Emma said. You just want to get my clothes off, don't you? Dexter was silent. You swim if you want to, Dexter, Emma went on. I'm not going to show my body to the world, and you've forgotten rule four. A moment later, Dexter had taken off all his clothes and was running into the sea. Emma suddenly felt stupid. Why can't I be free and uncomplicated like Dexter? She asked herself. Why do I care who sees me? She quickly took off her own clothes, and she too ran naked into the sea. Soon she was standing next to her friend. He turned to face her. Can we talk about Rule 3, Em? Dexter said gently. You see... I really want you. For a moment, Emma felt wonderful. He had said it at last. And it was going to happen, here and now, in the beautiful warm sea. Dex and Em, Em and Dex. It was going to happen. And then Dexter said the wrong thing. Of course, it isn't personal, I want nearly every woman that I meet, he added. That's my problem. I can't escape it. It's like a nightmare. Oh, poor Dexter, Emma said angrily. I feel really sorry for you. She was angry with Dexter, and she was angry with herself. You're a stupid, stupid woman, she told herself. You're stupid for thinking that he really cared about you. But a moment later, it was Dexter who was angry. He was looking over Emma's shoulder at the beach. A boy was stealing his clothes. Stop! Don't do that! Dexter shouted. He started to run towards the beach. Those trousers cost me two hundred pounds! He shouted at Emma, who was laughing. When they reached the beach, the boy and Dexter's expensive clothes had disappeared. He hadn't taken Emma's clothes. When she had stopped laughing, Emma got dressed, and Dexter found a torn blue plastic bag on the beach. 
He held this in front of him as they ran back to their room. On the way, they passed the English couple they had met on the ferry. I like the bag, the man said. The great colour! He laughed mockingly. Dexter didn't reply. But when they got back to their room, Dexter's anger had gone. It was a beautiful evening, and soon the stars were bright in the sky. He and Emma had some food, then they got into the bed and lay in the dark. They didn't touch each other, and they knew that their friendship was unchanged. Tell me a secret, Em, Dexter said. Tell me something about yourself that I don't know. Well, I don't want to make you more arrogant than you already are, Emma replied. But here's something you didn't know. Before I first talked to you, when we were students, I was in love with you, and I used to write poems about you. That was before you knew me, Dexter said. Aren't you in love with me now? Oh, now? Things are quite different now, said Emma. When she said that, Dexter started thinking about his own secrets. He'd never told Emma that he'd once slept with Tilly Killick. It had happened when he was visiting the flat Emma and Tilly shared. Emma had gone out to the shops for an hour. He was never going to tell her about that. He didn't know that Emma knew about it already and it wasn't a secret at all. Tell me about those poems, Dexter said quietly after a few minutes. What rhymed with Dexter? Monster, Emma replied quickly. It's a half rhyme. Em, Dexter said a few minutes later. How many rules did I break today? Three, Emma said. You broke rules one? Two and four. And we nearly broke rule three, Dexter thought. But we have eight more days. Anything can happen in eight days. Well, at least we didn't play any board games, he said aloud. Emma was asleep. Part 2. Their Late Twenties Chapter 6. Poison Thursday, the 15th of July, 1993. Belsize Park, London and Oxfordshire. Dexter Mayhew was sitting in his flat in Belsize Park. It was 10am and Dexter was very drunk. He had been drinking all night with some new friends. Now that he worked in television, lots of people wanted to know Dexter. They all wanted to hear his stories about the famous people that he interviewed. They all wanted to drink with him. So he was often drunk these days. Usually being drunk in the mornings didn't matter. Dexter worked in the afternoons and evenings and he was always sober by then. But this morning... The morning of the 15th of July, it mattered very much. Today, he had to go to his parents' house in the country, in Oxfordshire. He was already late. He knew, in part of his mind, that he wanted to be late. In fact, in that part of his mind, he didn't want to go at all. Because today, thinking about his parents made him want to scream. Dexter's mother, at 49, was 15 years younger than his father. Dexter liked his father, and they usually got on well together. But his feelings about his mother were quite different. Dexter loved his mother more than anyone in the world. But now his mother was dying, and Dexter knew that she couldn't live much longer. He needed to see her, but he was afraid. He was afraid to see how close to death she was. 
So this morning he needed to be strong. He needed to make himself drive to his childhood home. And he needed to make himself behave normally when he got there. Dexter looked at the large parcel, wrapped in brightly coloured paper, which he'd put next to his front door. He'd put it there so that he wouldn't forget it when he went out, even if he was drunk. The parcel was a present for his mother from his good friend, Emma Morley. Emma and his mother were very different people, but when they had met they had always enjoyed each other's company. And Stephen and Alison Mayhew had guessed that Emma was a good friend to their son. They hadn't really been offended at all when Emma called Stephen a bourgeois fascist. Remembering this, for a moment Dexter wanted to phone Emma. The two of them had still never touched each other, but he knew that she was his best friend. Suddenly he wanted to tell her that she was a dear, wonderful person, and he wanted to tell her how unhappy he was about his mother's terrible illness. But he knew what Emma would say. She'll know I'm drunk as soon as I start to speak, he told himself. She'll tell me that I mustn't drive. Dexter picked up his car keys and collected Emma's parcel. He locked the door of his flat behind him and walked to his expensive green sports car. An hour later, Dexter was still worrying about his dying mother, but he also knew that he was lucky to be alive himself. He had fallen asleep for a moment and had almost crashed his car into a big truck. He could still hear the noise of the truck's horn in his aching head. He wasn't far from his parents' house now, but he had to stop for a while. He slowed down and drove into a pub car park. It was a pub which he had often visited when he was young. He bought a glass of vodka and a glass of beer and sat down. He drank quickly and soon he was feeling better. He walked outside into the sunlight and got into his car. In less than twenty minutes he parked in front of his parents' house, just as his father opened the front door. I'd hoped you were coming earlier, his father said as Dexter got out of the car. He looked angry, and when Dexter tried to kiss him on the cheeks, he moved quickly away. At the television studios, everyone kissed everyone else on the cheeks. Dexter had forgotten for a moment that his father lived in a different world. Your mother hoped you were coming earlier too, Stephen Mayhew added. He looked carefully at his son, then he sighed deeply. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, Dexter said unhappily. How is she, Dad? You need to ask her that yourself, Mr. Mayhew said. Go up to her room now, I'll make us some lunch. Dexter walked slowly up the stairs, carrying Emma's present. He opened the door of his mother's bedroom and went nervously inside. Alison Mayhew was sitting up in her bed. She was very thin, and she looked very tired and ill, but she smiled when she saw her son. A present? What have you brought me? she asked. The present is from Emma, Dexter said. Let's open it. The parcel contained books, long, serious books. Edith Wharton, Scott Fitzgerald, Raymond Chandler. How kind she is, Alison Mayhew said. I'm very grateful to Emma, but please suggest to her that short stories might be more useful in future. Dexter tried to laugh, but inside his head he was screaming. A few minutes later he went downstairs to the kitchen where his father was making lunch. Dexter picked up a glass of wine and drank it quickly. Then he refilled the glass. Dexter, please be careful, his father said. You drink too much. Alcohol is poison for you these days. 
I've got a headache, Dad, Dexter said. I've been working too hard. I'm going to lie down for half an hour. I don't need any food. He went upstairs to the room he had slept in when he was a child. A few minutes later, he was unconscious on his childhood bed. It was evening when Dexter woke. The whole afternoon had passed. He went to find his father in the kitchen. I'm sorry, Dad, he said. I didn't mean to sleep that long. Why didn't you wake me? It wasn't my job. You're not a child any longer, Dexter, his father replied angrily. And you were so drunk there wasn't any point in waking you. You don't think that your mother wanted to see you like this, do you? I'm sorry, Dexter said again. He looked around the room. Where did I put my car keys? I have to go now. I've got them, and I'm going to keep them, his father replied. You must not drive when you're drunk, Dexter. You'll kill yourself, or you'll kill someone else, which will be worse. I'll drive you to the station now. You can get the train back to London, and you can come and collect your car at the weekend, if you're sober by then. Perhaps you'll be able to talk sensibly to your mother then, too. Dexter tried to argue, but his father wouldn't listen to him, and he wouldn't talk to him on the way to the station. But as Dexter was getting out of the car, the older man held his arm. Listen to me, Dexter, Stephen Mayhew said very seriously. Your mother was looking forward to your visit today, and now she's very upset. She hasn't long to live, you must know that. If you come here drunk again, I won't let you into the house to see her. Do you understand me? I won't open the door to you. Stephen drove away, and Dexter walked sadly into the station. When he was waiting for the train, he tried to phone Emma. Emma will understand me, he told himself. I need to see Emma. But Emma wasn't at home. He left a message on her answer phone. He asked if they could meet later that evening. He said he'd call again. When he got back to his flat and called again, Dexter still got the answer phone. Emma, where are you? he said to the machine. I miss you. I need you. I'll try again later. Covent Garden and King's Cross, London Emma didn't get any of Dexter's phone messages that evening because she wasn't at home. When Dexter left his first message, she had just left her flat in Earl's Court, West London. She was walking to the nearby underground station. She was on her way to an Italian restaurant in Covent Garden where she was going to meet Ian Whitehead. Emma had only seen Ian a few times since she had left Loco Caliente to train as a teacher, but they were still friends. They sometimes talked on the phone, and tonight he had invited her to meet him for dinner. They had been friends for three years, but Emma had never slept with Ian. She knew that he wanted to sleep with her. She liked him, but did she want to sleep with him too? She didn't know, and she wondered now how the evening was going to end. At the station, Emma bought a ticket and waited for her train. Soon it arrived, and Emma boarded it. She sat and thought about how her life had changed since she had met Ian. She no longer shared a flat with Tilly Killock. Now she lived on her own in the small rented flat in Earl's Court. And now she was ready for a new career. Tomorrow she was going to an interview for a job as a teacher of English and drama. The job was in a comprehensive school in Leytonstone, in a poor part of East London. Emma was very confident about this job. She had enjoyed her year at teacher training college, and she knew that she was going to be a brilliant teacher. Yes, her life had changed. But Emma knew that her character had changed too. She had mellowed. She no longer had a strong opinion about everything that happened in the world. Sometimes she could even see that there were two sides to any argument. 
I'm twenty-seven. Perhaps that's the reason, she thought. Perhaps I'm getting old. Perhaps I'm ready to compromise. When Emma arrived at the restaurant, she saw that Ian was already there. She hoped that this was the beginning of a pleasant evening. Later, she'd decide about what was going to happen next. They ordered food and wine, and Ian started to talk. He seemed very nervous, and Emma tried to help him to relax. But an hour later, at about the time Dexter was leaving his second message on her answer phone, Emma was feeling desperate. Ian had been trying much too hard to make her laugh. She guessed that he was practicing his stand-up comedy act on her. The problem was that everything he said was a joke, and it was impossible to have a conversation with him. This was driving her crazy. She guessed that Ian was feeling desperate too. Everything he said made the evening worse. In part of her mind, Emma wanted to leave and go home. But in another part of her mind, she felt terribly sorry for Ian. It was clear to her that he wasn't a good comedian, and that his ambition to have a career in stand-up was just a dream. At last, she couldn't listen to any more bad jokes. Ian, she said suddenly, "Will you be quiet for a minute, please? Will you just shut up?" Ian looked very surprised. And he stopped talking. After a few minutes of silence, he asked quietly, "Do you see your friend Dexter much these days?" Emma suddenly understood why Ian had been so nervous all evening. "No, we don't meet very often," she replied. "But we speak on the phone most days. He's busy with his TV career and his girlfriends." You know what Dexter's like. He's always been a bit crazy, and now he's a bit more crazy. I think his mother is seriously ill, and he's drinking far too much. I'm sorry to hear that," said Ian. Then, after a pause, he said, "To be honest, I never liked him much. I always thought that he took you for granted." They were both silent for a few minutes. Then Ian spoke again. Well, we finished the wine, he said. Shall we have some brandy? By the time they left the restaurant, Emma and Ian were both a bit drunk. Outside the restaurant, Emma turned to Ian and kissed him. She had decided that tonight she was ready to compromise. Shall I come home with you? She asked quietly. Emma, that's a lovely idea," Ian told her. And when Dexter phoned Emma's number again at midnight, there still wasn't anyone at home. Emma was at Ian Whitehead's, and she was going to stay there until morning. Dexter was now feeling desperate, so he called another number. "Hi, Naomi. This is Dexter," he said in his television voice. I miss you, girl. I need you tonight. Can you find a taxi and come to my flat? Chapter Seven: Show Business. Friday, the fifteenth of July, nineteen ninety-four. Nathan Stone and the Isle of Dogs. East London. Emma Morley got up early on the fifteenth of July. Emma now lived in a rented flat in Leytonstone. It was quite near Cromwell Road Comprehensive School, where she taught English and drama. She had moved to the flat when she started teaching at the school in the autumn of the year before. Ian Whitehead spent much of his time at the flat too. Emma thought she was probably in love with Ian. I am in love with him, aren't I? She asked herself daily, and every day she told herself that she was in love with him. 
Yes, of course she was in love with him. And her parents liked him very much, especially her mother. That was important to her. It's good when people's partners and mothers get on well, she thought. But Ian did take up a lot of space in the little flat. But Emma had a bigger problem than the size of her flat. Ian Whitehead and Dexter Mayhew, the two men in her life, still didn't get on well. Dexter didn't like Emma's friendship with Ian, even though he had his own girlfriends. The truth was that Dexter needed Emma as an emotional support, but Ian didn't really understand this need. And Emma was especially important to Dexter now that his mother had died. Ian was also very jealous of Dexter, because he didn't want Emma to have a best friend who wasn't himself. All this was a special problem on the 15th, because when the evening came, Emma was really needed in three places at once. Tonight was going to be Dexter's big night. Tonight a new program was going to be on television and Dexter was one of the presenters. This program, Late at Night, was a much more important one than The Bigger Picture, and perhaps it was going to make Dexter a big star. Another of the presenters, a glamorous woman called Suki Meadows, was already a star. The program was going to be live, and Dexter wanted Emma to be at the television studio to support him. He no longer saw his other friends from university. He no longer wanted to see them. Callum O'Neill, whose computer business was doing well, often called. He left messages on Dexter's answer phone, but Dexter never called him back. Emma was the only one of his old friends that he cared about. But tonight was going to be Emma's big night, too. Emma was in charge of her school's end-of-year drama production, the musical Oliver, and the performance was happening tonight. Of course, this wasn't as important as Dexter's programme, but clearly Emma had to be there. She'd spent many weeks preparing the children for the show, and she had to be with them. Tonight, their parents were coming to watch them. And for their parents, they were all going to be little stars, for one night at least. Emma hoped it was going to make her the headmaster's little star, too. Her teaching career, making a difference, was just as important as Dexter's more glamorous TV career, she thought. She knew that Dexter didn't really believe this. And then there was Ian. Ian was feeling ill today. He didn't really want to go out at all tonight, and he didn't want her to go out. But she understood. She loved him, didn't she? And he was going to come to Oliver, even if he still felt ill. He'd promised her that. Before leaving to go to work, Emma picked up the phone and called Dexter's number. She got his answer phone. Hi! Speak to me! Leave me a message! Dexter's cockney voice said on the recording. So she left him a message. Hi, Dex. I'm sorry it's early for you, she said. You're probably not awake yet, but some of us have jobs to go to. I'm sorry I won't be with you at the studio tonight, but I want to wish you luck. I know you understand that it's my big night too. That's sure business, Dex. I'll speak to you later. Lots of love to you. Oh, and Dex? You really have to change that answer phone message. Dexter Mayhew wasn't feeling good when he arrived at the television studio on the Isle of Dogs. It was his father's fault. His father had left a message on his answer phone earlier in the day. I called to wish you luck for tonight, his father had said. I'll be watching the programme. It's so sad that your mother isn't here to see you. She was so proud of you. Well, good luck, Dexter, and don't take any notice of the newspapers. 
When he'd heard the message, Dexter had gone out and bought all the daily newspapers. He'd opened the first one at the television pages and read the headline. Is Dexter Mayhew the nastiest man on TV? Dexter had drunk some vodka to settle his nerves as he read the story beneath the headline. The story wasn't kind to him. Dexter was a stupid, rich boy who'd been educated at Winchester College but pretended to be a cockney, the author wrote mockingly. Dexter thought that he was popular with young people, the author said, but really young people just laughed at him. They didn't connect with him at all. Dexter had felt sick when he read this, and he had had several more drinks before he arrived at the television studio that evening. In his dressing room at the studio, Dexter sat quietly trying to relax. He had told the producer of the show that he wanted to be alone. He was nervous. He had been a TV presenter for several years now, so he was surprised at how nervous he felt. He didn't know what he was going to say when the show started. When he thought about the whole hour the show was going to last, his mind was suddenly empty. Now he was very frightened, and the show was going to start in a few minutes. He took a bottle of vodka from his overcoat pocket. There was a bottle of water on a table in the dressing room. Presenters usually took a bottle of water onto the set with them. The studio lights were always very hot, and they often needed to drink some water when they were off camera. They couldn't speak clearly if their mouths were dry. But Dexter wanted something to clear his mind, not something to wet his mouth. He emptied the water into his wash basin and refilled the bottle with vodka. Then he put it back on the table. It looked the same as before. Nobody would know that he was drinking vodka. Hey there, said a loud voice. Well, how about all this? The owner of the loud voice was Suki Meadows. Suki was already a popular presenter of late-night TV shows. Now she stood at the door, smiling at Dexter. She was a small, pretty, friendly person, and she was always cheerful. Always. It didn't matter what was happening around her. She was cheerful, and she was noisy. Why does Suki always speak in capital letters? Dexter had sometimes asked himself. But tonight he was thinking something else. The viewers all love her, and she is very sexy, he was thinking, and I'm sure she's crazy about me. Suki was wearing a very short skirt and a shirt made of very thin cloth, and she was holding her own bottle of water. Come here, Dex, she said, entering the dressing room. She put her water bottle on the table next to his and put her arms around him. You're going to be great tonight. We're going to be great together. Dex and Suki, Suki and Dex. What a team, Dex. And having wished him good luck in her own way, Suki led Dexter out of the dressing room. On the way, they picked up their water bottles. Outside, on the set, they picked up their microphones and inserted their earpieces. They looked around them at the brightly coloured set and the brightly dressed dancers who were standing ready to begin the warm-up before the show. Then the music started. The dancers danced. When they had finished, Suki walked to the front of the set and yelled to the audience. Are you ready to have a great time? We'll make some noise for us! At that moment, Dexter realised that he was hopelessly drunk. Now it was his turn to speak, and he couldn't say anything. He didn't know what to say. This show was going to be a disaster. Someone in the audience shouted, You useless idiot! Can't you speak? Dexter had an idea. Well, he's clearly been reading the newspapers, he shouted to the audience. He tried to laugh. 
A few of the audience laughed too, but not many of them. Dexter needed another drink to clear his head, he told himself. He took the top off his water bottle and drank. It was water. Just water. At once he understood. The bottles had got mixed up. Suki had the vodka. And she was taking the top off her bottle. He wanted to stop her drinking, but it was too late. As she tasted the liquid, Dexter saw the shock in her eyes. And at that moment, the live program began. We're live. Say something, Dexter, the producer's voice said in his earpiece. But Dexter couldn't speak, and Suki was coughing. She recovered first, and she came to Dexter's rescue. Sorry about that, but at least you viewers know that the program is live, she said. Suki went on speaking. Dexter tried hard to think clearly, and after a few minutes he was able to perform better with Suki. He wasn't very good, but he wasn't terrible. And Suki was amazing. She always spoke when Dexter didn't know what to say, and she tried to make Dexter look normal. The show wasn't a disaster. When the program had finished, there was a party for all the people who had appeared in it and their friends and relations. Dexter stayed for the party, but he was quiet and thoughtful. People congratulated him, but they didn't speak to him for long. He ate lots of food and drank lots of wine, but he wasn't happy. He knew that he hadn't performed well. He knew that Suki Meadows had rescued him, and he knew that she had been the star. Late in the evening, Suki came to sit next to him. That went okay, didn't it? she said. For the first time that day, she wasn't speaking in capital letters. You saved us, Suki, he said. I was trying to settle my nerves, but I drank too much before the show. I owe you an apology. Yes, you do, she replied. You have a problem with alcohol, and we need to talk about it. You must understand this, Dexter. You won't appear on this program with me again if you aren't sober. And you must never bring alcohol onto the set again. What can I do to make you feel better about me? Dexter asked her. Well, you can take me out for dinner next week, Suki said. Take me somewhere very expensive on Tuesday. Dexter thought for a moment. He had promised to meet Emma on Tuesday evening, but he could change that. Emma was his best friend. She was always there for him. All right, he replied. We have a date. Good, said Suki, kissing him. And now you must come and meet my mother. Dexter was feeling a bit unhappy on the Isle of Dogs, but Emma was on top of the world in Leytonstone. Oliver had been a great success. Of course, there had been arguments and fights among the children before the show. That always happened. They were excited and some of them were nervous. But Emma had settled their nerves and when the music began, they all worked together and helped each other. So the show had been wonderful. Phil Godalming, Emma's head teacher, was very pleased. People whose children could act and sing like that were going to be proud, he thought. They were going to speak well of the school, and of its head teacher, of course. At the party after the show, the school staff and many of the proud parents of the cast congratulated Emma. She drank her wine and smiled at everyone. And late in the evening, Mr. Godalming came to sit next to her. You're a wonderful teacher. Emma, he said quietly in her ear, and you look very beautiful tonight. I have great plans for you next year.
Chapter 8. A Crisis. Saturday, the 15th of July, 1995. Walthamstow, East London, and Soho, Central London. I'm going out now, Ian, Emma called. Then she added carefully, Are you sure that you don't want to come with me, darling? Dexter will be pleased to see you if you do come. No, I can't come tonight, Ian replied, entering the room. I've got things to do tonight, don't you remember? I'm performing at the House of Ha Ha. You go on your own. I'll be fine. This was the right answer, Emma thought. She was quite glad that she was going to see Dexter alone. She wanted to talk to him about her relationship with Ian Whitehead. Emma was beginning to understand that she had made a bad mistake about Ian. They were living together now, in a flat in Walthamstow. They had bought the flat together, and that was the mistake. Ian loved her very much, Emma knew this, and she had told herself often that she really loved him too, and that she wanted to spend her life with him. But she now knew that it wasn't true. She was no longer happy with Ian. She just didn't love him. She knew that Ian hated the success of her career, and that he hated the failure of his own career. He still wanted desperately to be a stand-up comedian, but he only ever performed at pubs and small comedy clubs. Ian just wasn't very good at stand-up, and he didn't earn much money from it. Emma was feeling trapped. So she needed Dexter to understand. She hoped it was going to be possible to talk sensibly to him tonight. She was feeling a little nervous about that. Perhaps talking about Ian wasn't going to be easy. In the past, it had been easy to talk to Dexter. But now he had changed. He drank far too much, and he was more careless than ever about people's feelings. Ian wasn't Emma's only problem, of course. She was no longer enjoying her job much, either. She was a good teacher, she knew that. But she got tired, and she didn't have much time to write. She still wanted to be a writer, but when she did write, the results were never very good. That was as bad a problem as her relationship with Ian. But the greatest problem for Emma was that she knew in her heart that Dexter Mayhew was the person she really loved. So there it was. Everything was a bit hopeless. Ian's career wasn't what he'd hoped for, and her career wasn't what she'd hoped for. She had a feeling that Dexter's career wasn't quite what he'd hoped for either. Suki Meadows was his girlfriend these days. But she was now clearly the star presenter of Late at Night. Dex was definitely the number two person. He wasn't very popular with the audience, and nasty people often wrote cruel things about him in the newspapers now. Emma and Dexter were meeting for dinner at an expensive restaurant in Soho. It was the kind of place where fashionable people ate, people in television, like Dexter and Suki Meadows. Emma hoped she was going to like it. Dexter was waiting for Emma outside the restaurant. He was talking on his mobile phone. Emma heard his caller's voice quite clearly as she arrived. Ten million viewers this week, Dex, the voice said very loudly. Ten million! Suki, let me explain something about telephones, Dex replied into the phone. You don't need to shout into them. The phone does the shouting for you. I have to go now, he added when he saw Emma. I'll see you soon. Dex, those things are so stupid, Emma said, pointing at Dexter's phone. Why don't you throw it away? You'll have one in less than six months, Dexter replied, kissing her. You'll see, I'm right. They went inside the restaurant and sat at the bar where Dexter bought drinks. 
After a few minutes, they heard a soft female voice behind them. Do you want cigarettes, sir? The voice said. They turned to see a very tall, extraordinarily beautiful girl. The girl was dressed only in black underwear and stockings, and she carried a tray containing the cigarettes. She had a fixed smile. It wasn't a happy smile. Dexter bought some cigarettes. He spent a long time finding his money so that he could look at the girl's body. Then the girl moved away. Why is she dressed like that, Dexter? Emma said. I don't know, Em, Dexter replied. Perhaps all her ugly clothes are in the laundry. You could look like that if you wanted, he added. You've got a great body. But I don't want to look like that, said Emma. Soon a waiter took them to their table. They ordered drinks, and when those arrived, they ordered food. Dexter was drinking quickly. And soon he'll be drunk again, Emma told herself, and she couldn't stop thinking about the cigarette girl. Why am I eating in the kind of restaurant where girls have to dress like that? She asked herself. Then she asked Dexter the same question. This place is terrible, Dex, Emma said. Haven't women made any progress in the last hundred years? You don't understand, Em, Dexter said. Dressing like that gives her power over men. She enjoys it. Don't be stupid, Dexter, Emma said. The owner of this place makes her wear those clothes. If she doesn't wear them, she'll lose her job. She only works here because she needs the money. You can see that. She has no power over anyone. Well, you're still the same old Emma, aren't you? Dexter said crossly. Emma, the angry socialist feminist. I thought that you'd mellowed, but clearly I was wrong about that. You never want to compromise, do you? After that, the evening got worse and worse. Dexter frequently left the table to visit the toilet. Each time he stopped to talk to the cigarette girl. The last time it happened, Emma saw him push a piece of paper into her stocking. Emma had no doubt that he was giving the girl his phone number. When he returned to the table, Emma decided she had had enough of his behaviour. She pushed the table away from her, spilling their drinks, and ran up the stairs out of the restaurant. She could hear Dexter behind her, calling her name. She didn't turn round. In the street, Dexter finally caught up with her. Emma, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you, he said desperately. Suddenly, Emma turned to face him. Dexter, whenever I see you now, you're drunk, she said. I haven't seen you sober for three years. I don't know you any longer. You're obnoxious these days. You were always a bit obnoxious, but now you're totally obnoxious. I'm just having fun, Emma, Dexter replied. Well, it isn't fun for me, Emma replied. Let's stop this now, Dexter. You don't care about me. We don't have to meet any more. Emma, of course we have to meet, Dexter said desperately. We're Dex and M, aren't we? We'll always be Dex and M. For a moment he was quiet. He was thinking of the day of his mother's funeral. He was thinking of Emma's kindness to him that day. She had held him as he cried uncontrollably. He had always taken her for granted. He knew that. Why am I throwing all this away? He was asking himself. But he knew that he couldn't stop himself. Dexter, Emma said sadly. I love you very much. And I probably always will love you. But I'm afraid... I don't like you any longer. I don't like the person that you've become. I don't want to hear from you again. Please don't try to contact me. 
she left him standing in the street and walked away. Part 3 Their Early Thirties Chapter 9 Things End Monday, the 15th of July, 1996 Leightonstone and Walthamstow, East London At six o'clock on the last day of term at Cromwell Road Comprehensive School, almost everyone had gone home. Only Emma Morley and Mr Godalming, the school's head teacher, were still in the building. They were lying on the floor of Mr Godalming's office. I'll miss you very much during the holidays, Emma, Mr. Godalming said as they put on their clothes. I'll miss our Friday afternoons together. No, you won't, Phil. You'll have Mrs. Godalming, Emma replied unkindly. You'll be fine. Emma wondered as she spoke why she always felt so cross after their meetings in the head teacher's office. Afterwards, she always felt unhappy and that made her cross. They collected their coats and books, and the head teacher locked the office. As they walked to the school car park, Emma was thinking hard. She had been Phil Godalming's lover for nine months now, and she was starting to worry about this. She was afraid that he was going to tell his wife about their relationship and ask for a divorce. That was not what Emma wanted at all. She didn't love Phil. She had never really loved him. For a short time, he had made her feel better when her life had become very sad. She wasn't seeing Dexter any longer, and she missed him. And her relationship with Ian Whitehead had gone wrong. Phil had helped her to be confident during the bad times, but she certainly didn't want to marry him. And she thought now that it was time for this relationship to end. As Mr. Godalming opened the door of his car, Emma held his arm. Phil, I'm sorry, but I don't want to be your lover any longer, she said. I feel bad about our relationship. I feel bad about your wife. I I'm not happy. You were very happy ten minutes ago, Emma, the head teacher said. He laughed. No, Phil. You were very happy ten minutes ago, Emma replied sadly. Phil Godalming wasn't pleased to hear Emma's words. He'd enjoyed their after-school meetings on Fridays. He argued for some time that clearly Emma wasn't going to change her mind. We'll talk about this next term, he said. He got into his car, closed the door and drove quickly out of the car park. Emma travelled sadly home to Walthamstow on the underground. On her way home, she bought some wine to drink later. She was going to spend the evening on her own. Ian Whitehead no longer lived with her. They had ended their relationship after a terrible argument. They had argued about Ian's jealousy and his selfishness. At the end of their argument, they had both cried. They had cried for each other and for the end of their relationship, but they both knew that it had to end. It had all been so sad, Emma thought now, as she sat in the train. Late that evening, after she had drunk the wine, Emma turned on her television. The first person she saw was Dexter Mayhew. Suddenly, Emma realised that it was exactly a year since she had spoken to him. She knew that Dexter's TV career hadn't been very successful recently. Viewers had never really loved him, it seemed. They had only loved to hate him. And nowadays, most of them just hated him. Dexter was now presenting a very late-night TV show about computer games. Few people watched it. Emma did watch the show for a few minutes. She thought that Dexter wasn't looking well. His face was looking tired and he no longer seemed confident. Suddenly, Emma had a great feeling of friendship and love for him. 
she realised that for the last eight years she had thought about Dexter every day. Now she knew that she wanted his friendship again. She wanted him to be her best friend again. I'll call him tomorrow, she told herself. I really will call him. Chapter 10. Resignation. Tuesday the 15th of July, 1997. Central London. The River Thames looked lovely on this warm, sunny afternoon, Emma Morley thought. It was a work day, but Emma wasn't at school. Teaching had finished for the term, but there was a very important staff meeting happening at the school. Emma was needed there but she didn't really care about that. She had phoned the head teacher's secretary that morning and told her that she was ill and had to stay in bed. The woman clearly hadn't believed her. Emma didn't care about that either. Emma wasn't really ill at all. In fact, she was feeling good, and she had been to a meeting, a meeting with a publisher. At last, Emma was feeling confident about something she had written. A novel for young readers. It was about a group of children at an East London school. The children were appearing in a school production of Oliver, and the story was told by one of the actors, a girl called Julie Criscoll. Julie was a rude, angry teenage girl with a good heart. The book was funny and touching. Emma had included silly drawings and handwritten pages in her text so parts of it looked like a schoolgirl's diary. She knew that what she had written was really good, and now other people thought it was good too. Perhaps soon she was going to be a published author. Emma wanted to write, and she wanted even more to stop teaching. She thought every day about resigning. Her job at the school had been very difficult for the last year. Phil Godalming had been angry because she no longer wanted to sleep with him. He tried to make her life difficult all year. And now she knew that she could write well. Emma wanted to spend her life writing. At her meeting this morning, she had told the publisher about her ambitions. The publisher had been helpful. Emma's life was going to change. As she walked by the river, her mobile phone rang. Emma did now have a mobile. Dexter had been right after all. Phil had given it to her during the months when they'd been close. I want to be able to hear your voice at any time, he told her. As she took the phone from her handbag, Emma guessed that it was Phil phoning her now. She wasn't wrong. So you're ill in bed, are you? He said in his special, loud, angry headteacher's voice. Well, I don't believe it. I think you're outside enjoying the sunshine. I can hear the traffic noise. Don't shout at me, Phil, Emma said quietly. My name's Mr. Gobbleming, not Phil the man replied. This is serious, you know that. I told you that today's meeting was a very important one. There'll be trouble about this, Emma, and if you don't want a relationship with me, I won't protect you from trouble. Your job is in danger. <laughs> no, it isn't, Emma replied, laughing. I'm resigning from my job now. Do you understand? I've resigned. Goodbye, Mr. Godalming. She switched off her phone, and for a moment she thought about throwing it into the river. But after a few seconds, she put it back in her bag. Chapter 11 Dexter in Love Wednesday the 15th of July, 1998 Chichester, Sussex 
Dexter Mayhew was lying in bed with Sylvie Cope at the end of a difficult day. Recently, something strange had happened to Dexter. He had fallen in love. He'd had many lovers, but he'd never been in love before. And now the girl beside him was more important to him than anything in the world. He almost couldn't believe his luck. Sylvie was tall, slim and beautiful, with long, straight hair and a heart-shaped face. She and Dexter had known each other for several months, and they spent lots of time together. Every weekend they flew to a different European city, and they always had a wonderful time. They spent lots of Dexter's money in expensive shops. Sylvie was excited to know Dexter in real life after seeing him on television. But the truth was that Dexter liked Sylvie much more than she liked him. But Dexter actually enjoyed this. It meant that Sylvie was different from his other girlfriends. Sylvie worked in marketing. Dexter had met many of her friends who also worked in marketing. He hadn't liked them, and they hadn't liked him. Who cared? And tonight, 